Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. And thank you all for showing up and for um, spending some time with us. Hopefully I caught your attention with the title that XML saves lives. And hopefully you'll see by the time we're done here today, that that really is true, that it really can make that much of a difference. And XML can have a profound impact on your information. So I wasn't just being dramatic. It really is true. So before we get going, I want to talk about who this session is for, because if, if you know, you might want to have the gift of time back if it's not for you. So this session is geared for people who create content that informs and instructs. So if you fall into that category, then stick around. If you manage a team that creates content, then stick around, especially if they've been trying to talk to you about XML. This presentation hopefully will help you understand a little bit more. If you're just curious about XML and we're afraid to ask, then you're in safe hands here. You feel free to ask me any questions. I can be interrupted throughout the presentation. It's OK. Um, or you can save them for the end. And if we run out of time, trust me, I will respond to all questions afterwards, too. Now, perhaps you're somebody who already understands the value of XML, you're pretty excited about it, but you're looking for ways to help others understand. Perhaps you're trying to sell it to the C-suite or you're trying to get the person who holds the purse strings to liberate some funds to help you move into XML. Hopefully by the end of this session, you'll have something to show them, to share with them that will help them understand the real value and what it means to your organization. Other than that, the other category, you're just here because you want the prizes, then stick around because there are prizes. Before we get going, I want to tell you who Single Sourcing Solutions is. In case you don't know who we are, Liz Fraley is our founder and CEO. We've been around for a while. We kind of come from the background that uh, the technical communicators are in. So we have a little different approach. It's a little bit different, but that's OK. Uh, we're kind of pragmatic that way. We offer a dynamic solution for helping you adopt and adapt uh, XML authoring in your team. We believe firmly in empowering others. That's like our, it's written into our DNA. So in everything, we try to strengthen your team. We have some public works projects that we're particularly proud of. We're always involved in community outreach and community efforts. So I'll give you a link at the end and you'll be able to check out some of our free public works that you can tune into. And they're all geared towards uh, professional and technical communicators. And they're various topics and quite interesting, if you ask me. So I did say there's prizes. So I want you to look for the hidden Easter eggs through the slide deck. If you find one or more, send me an email and I seriously will send you a prize. I'm not kidding. All right. So let's get started. So who should even care about XML? So the people who really should care about XML is if you create or your company creates a product or a service that serves people, then you really need to take a look at XML. You really need to think about it seriously. If you are professional, you create, um, sorry, professional technical information that informs or instructs people, then you really need to take a look at XML. So if you don't fall into those two categories, then if you're doing fiction writing, maybe not. XML might not be for you. But practically everybody else, XML is for you. Now, if you create content or communications that are in a highly regulated industry, for example, in the US, we've got the F FDA. So anyone who's in pharmaceutical or cosmeceutical or um, cosmetic or medical or medical device, you definitely should be in XML. F, A, and D, anyone in defense, aerospace, you really need to be in XML. And there is a growing demand. And I'm not sure how it is in APAC. I know APAC and the European Union, they all have different ministries and agencies and institutes in all of the different countries. Um, 
But I know in the United States, there's a growing requirement that you submit information in XML because they get it at the higher level. And these people are dealing with big data. But the beauty of XML is it doesn't just apply. Size doesn't matter. XML works on a small company and it works on a large company. It works on small data and it works on big data. Um, so don't let that determine whether or not you look at XML. Again, go back to the first thing. If you create a product or a service that serves people, then you're going to have to communicate to the people. And that's where XML can make a huge difference for you. So think about it. If you've got a product or a service and people use it, something may go wrong. Heaven forbid, but something may go wrong. What happens when the investigators take over? When they're investigating accidents and incidences, What's the first thing? Well, maybe not the first thing. Perhaps it's like the second or it's definitely in the top five. What's the, what are they going to do? They're going to look to the documentation. That's where they're going to find their answers, the cold, hard answers that they're looking for. They're looking for what were the instructions? Were there warnings? Were there cautions? What was the maintenance manual? What was the maintenance record? Who had access to the information? How was this access? How was this information delivered? Was it in print? Was it digital? Was it uh, in alignment? Did they agree or were they different? Did they mismatch? All of these things all comes down to the accuracy, timeliness, and usability of the information that you provide to the end users. That's why your information becomes so mission critical and it can really make, make the difference between life and death in certain situations. And XML can help you lock in your accuracy, make things more usable for your end users and help you deliver information in a more timely manner. So think of it this way. XML is kind of like the, the, the uh, lifesaver, the life supports that first aid kit for your information. It will help you reduce the risk because it improves the accuracy. It has a structure that's enforced and that structure requires compliance from everybody who contributes. The other thing is it improves collaboration. So if you've got different departments collaborating on content or you've got different people in your company in the same department, collaborating on a full project. You've got people across boundaries and borders and time zones. If you're in structured authoring, it's easier for people to adapt and adopt a method and a procedure that matches. And again, you know, if you're going to submit to regulators, a lot of the regulators are starting to require that you be an XML. And I know there's some people um, who've kind of gamed the system a little bit for a little while and they've gotten away with you know doctoring things up in desktop publishing but that gap is closing now and that ability to kind of game the system is going away and really honestly there's no good reason for you not to to get into xml it's not that scary it really isn't let's take a look at how xml compares with desktop publishing to get a deeper understanding of what XML is all about, how it works and what it does. So when we think of the typical desktop publishing, you're worried about all of these things, right? You're worried about H1, H2, H3. You're worried about the font, family, size, color, all of these attributes that have to do with formatting the contents. You're worried about your list. Is it an ordered list or is it numbered or is it alpha? Is it capitals, is it lowercase? Is it, if you've got bulleted lists, what kind of bullet are you using? What happens to the nested levels? All of these things you're concerned about as you're also supposed to be creating content. You're worrying about formatting issues page layout. Do you have one column, two column? Formatting tables, like you're doing this in your desktop because what you see is what you get. So you're kind of like a little artist 
formatting your page so that when you go to print, it's going to look just like it does on the screen. Same thing with graphics. Your graphics should come in complete. Instead, I see a lot of people in desktop publishing or in different uh, layout tools putting in these lines. What happens if something changes? If you say, I don't know, you suddenly decide to change your H3 font, color, family, whatever. You'll have to go in because all of this is hard coded. You have to go into each one of the documents and you have to change each instance in order to have it reflect the new rule. This becomes so tedious and so time consuming and so fraught with errors that you know you're not going to be able to achieve this if you've got a large volume or even a mid-sized volume. You're not going to be able to achieve it successfully. And this is a challenge of hard coded. And if it's hard coded and you're worried about formatting and you're in a WYSIWYG, you're looking at how it looks here is how it's going to look when I print. But we know in this day and age, that's not all that can be done with your content, with the information that you're creating. And if you're thinking in those terms, then you're limiting yourself. This is where XML completely changes things for writing and author, for authoring and publishing content. Because in XML, we're separating our content from the page. We're lifting it up because the presentation that I see on the screen is only one possibility. It is not everything. So it's not, I'm not worried about the presentation. I'm looking at the content itself. And this is the biggest shift, I think, the biggest challenge that people have when they're coming over from desktop publishing into XML is this difference. Um, because we're not looking at things the same way. How XML works, it's like a wrapper, right? It's like the DNA wraps around and it has coded in it the message of what this is about. So when we're authoring in uh, XML and structured authoring, we're assigning DNA wrapper around the components that we're writing. So we're giving it a description. That's what we're doing. In the inception, how it all came about, and hopefully this will help you understand and not bore you to tears, but it came about when we had huge data that needed to be transmitted from one side of the country to the other side of the country through this lovely tunnel called the internet. So we're sending this data from one side to the next, but I want to make sure I'm the sender and I want to make sure that the receiving end is not met with just a series of letters, right? I want to make sure that there's a differentiation, so it's human readable. So I want to make sure that, you know, things look, a title looks a certain way. I want it to display a certain way. So my machine needs to tell your machine how to display it for you, the human, to read it. That's how XML, well, it was GML back then, that's how it came about. So you see, it's really, it's a way for one machine to communicate to another machine, right? Or a publishing engine or a software interface. And all it does is describe what's coming. It's like heralding the information, saying, hey, I've got a title, this is a title and treat the information that follows as a title until I tell you not to. And there's rules on that receiving end. It says, okay, I get it. I know what a title is and I know what to do with it. So I will display it or treat it appropriately. And the other beauty is I can treat it appropriately based on where it falls in the document, in the pecking order. Let me see if I can give you another example. And this is a page out of someone's manual. I don't know who, uh, if they wrote this in Dita or whatever, I don't care. But I want to use it as an example. So as an author, as a writer, remember before what we were talking about, H1, H2, and all those formatting issues. If I'm writing in structured authoring and XML, all I care about is that I've got titles, I've got paragraphs, 
I have lists. Now, perhaps I care about the kind of list. That's okay. And I've got a graphic and I've got an admonition. So I have, you know, a warning, caution, note kind of thing. And it gets treated a little bit different. I don't care from an author's perspective how it gets treated on the print. I only care that I know that this is an admonition and I need to treat it as such. If it's a note, I need to say, hey, this is a note. Let, let's look at this another in another angle. And this is a mock-up, so XML police out there do not. <laughs> I just threw this together really quick in Notepad. But I will tell you in doc book, chapter is chapter. Like, you can understand what the markup is. It's not scary. Like, a title is a title. That's the tag. Um, so if I were to take this and say, OK, well, if I mock this up, now I'm looking at structure. So you see the difference. I don't care what the font family is, the color. I don't care anything about the sizing. I don't even care that it's a two column layout. All I care is about the content that's on the page and that I'm saying the correct thing, that I'm telling a the machine that this is a title, treat it as such. Now the machine knows the difference between a title and a chapter, a title and a section, a title in a figure or a title in a table, and it will handle it appropriately based on a set of instructions that the writer doesn't need to worry about. That will handle itself automatically. And you see down here, I have a warning, right? So that's for that little admonition. And so say I, I have a certain set of rules that go with warning on how the interpretation needs to happen when you see warning do this. So the other thing, because I'm not concerned about layout on a page, I don't care. I'm not worried about the header. I'm not worried about the footer. I'm not worried about the page numbering. I'm not worried about that, that, that bar that's on the side or that number that's floating in that box. I don't care if you've got this uh, set for uh, a bound book. As a writer, I don't care because you might not be printing this out. Perhaps this information is to display on the internet via a web interface, or maybe it's an application. I'm not limited to the presentation medium because my customers aren't always reading a book. They're not always read, looking at a PDF. So if I've got this in XML, then I can meet my users where they need to be. Does that make sense? Hopefully. <laughs> Any questions so far? Then I'm going to move right along. Yeah, no questions yet. Yeah, that's OK. Um, so how XML works, it's really simple. There's two beats to XML to make it happen. You've got sending and receiving. And from the author's perspective, when I'm going to send information, I just wrap the content in the proper description. So as long as I am saying what's coming, I'm done. Now, on the receiving side, that's where you're doing your publishing or composition. And you can have multiple types of composition. And on this side, that mechanism understands how to lay it out based on the output requirement. That's the heartbeat of XML. So one of the huge advantages with XML, again, because we're, we're, we've lifted the information off of the page. We're not locked into what you see is what you get. We're liberating all of that. Now we've got descriptions wrapped around our content so we can meet the demands. What do you want to produce? Do you want to do a, a manual? Do you have a repair manual and you want to do some work cards? Right? Do you have some troubleshooting guides that are quick cards that are pullouts? Do you have, you know, an operator's guide and a handy quick reference card for them? You can produce all of this from the same content, from one source of truth. You don't have to reauthor it again. You can use the same XML marked up language 
or marked up content in that structure and you can reformat it based on your requirement or the profile. Perhaps you're creating manuals and one is an instructor manual and one is a, a learner manual or you're creating equipment and one is for a maintenance person and one is for an operator. Well, you can source information from the same sort, same single repository of truth to create information based on the profile of a person. You wanna do online help? No problem. You can do that. How does your customer want it? Well, do they want it in their native language? You know, doing things in XML, and we've, we've had customers that switch over to XML just for the localization. And if you're not localizing right now, you may in the future. So it's good to know that if you're in structured authoring, you can meet that demand in the future. But that's gonna be a growing thing um, if it's in their native language, becomes more and more critical. How are they receiving the information? Is, are they on a desktop? Are they on a smartphone? Again, if you're in structured authoring and you're XML, it doesn't care what the output device is because you can handle it. It will right size and correct itself for whatever device it needs to go on. That's what's handled on the receiving side on that composition side. You're not locked into what you see is what you get which is what you're locked into in desktop publishing. Um, if you're creating print, which print will not die, print is not dead, it will not die until computers stop breaking or until Wi-Fi stops going down. So print is always going to be there. You can produce to print as well, seamlessly and effortlessly. Um, do you need to meet an audience that wants to self-select and navigate their way through your content easily and efficiently? Then you should be an XML. And if you want to do a uh, search, online search, web, Google search, then you need to be an XML. You know, perhaps it might be a little sci-fi for you right now, but if you want to go into augmented reality, which is, you know, if you're in heavy equipment, if you're in aircraft, that's like, you should be looking to this for your future. Um, you're not gonna be able to get there in desktop. In XML, you will. So you wanna future-proof your content? XML is definitely the way you wanna go. Because a lot of times, um, if you're locked into a desktop application, it only understands its desktop application. But in XML, you saw uh, what I did, that little sample, it's human readable, and any XML aware tool can open it. It's not locked into a certain vendor tool, um, as long as you're in true XML. So now we're down to it. And the question is, should you do XML? Well, that depends. I can tell you the reasons why other people do it. So um, the top two reasons why people go in is because they're looking for quality and accuracy. Uh, they're, they want to reduce the amount of errors. They want to improve the richness of the content and they can't keep being held back by what you see is what you get. They need to liberate their writers to be able to focus on more important things. And that is improving the quality and the accuracy of the content that they're giving to the users. Cause that's really what the users care about, right? Usability, findability, accuracy of the information, the quality of the information, that's what's really important. And XML allows you to do that better. It locks things into a structure, so it makes it um, bulletproof. So that improves your quality and your accuracy and your collaboration across teams, across departments, inside your own team, because you're all doing things the same way. You know, I know that a lot of people in desktop publishing use templates. And I hope if you're in desktop publishing, you're at least trying with a template. 
But when do things ever, when you release it <laughs> for review, when does it ever come back to you unchanged? I mean, it always comes back changed. And then you're worried about formatting. Then you have to fix things. Was, we were working with a particular client of ours and their legal team was notorious with bullets. Their legal team had a certain perspective of how bullets should be represented on the page. And every single time they found a way to break the template and change the bullets because that's the way they liked it. So you had to spend all that time reformatting things to make sure that you've got the corporate look and feel that you're supposed to have when it comes back into the tech pubs group. Um, localization, right? So I talked about the other company um, who they actually went into XML because of the localization costs. I think they had, gosh, it was like 80% savings in localization cost and time because before they had to reformat everything or their localization company reformatted everything, hence huge costs. Um, and again, they're spending all that time formatting when XML in structured authoring, the formatting is automatic because the rules are applied at the publishing. So they didn't need to worry about formatting when the localized language came back. It was automated. Um, and expansion is another reason they want to go into new fields and they want to write it once and not have to write it over again in different formats. So they want to expand. Um, and there are a certain set of our clients have gone into XML because they were forced to. And a funny story, one of our clients uh, recently was forced to for contract obligations, then realized what they had gotten hold of, and then quickly decided they wanted to migrate all of their other documents into XML and structured authoring as well, because they started to see the benefits, right? They're forced to do something, and then they start to see, well, if I do this, look at all this other stuff that benefits the company as a whole, so we should move over. Content, your content is never static. That's another thing. Um, it, it's ever changing and ever evolving. And in order to meet the changing demands and needs, you want to be able to rise up. And in XML, it, it gives you that adaptability. So I can tell you some reasons why others didn't decide to go to XML, because there are people who decide not to. And usually it's three, one of three reasons. I mean, they give me a lot of reasons, but it really boils down to vision, fear, and value. Either they didn't see the need, and that could be because they're afraid of change, or they um, didn't see the need in their company, so they didn't see the vision of what XML does, so they were only short-sighted on what they're looking at right now. Their view was too, too focused on the here and now and not they're not able to lift up and look out on a broader scale and on the scale from a higher level to see what value would be better for the company. Another reason is they're comfortable with where they are. They know what they're doing. They've been doing it for a long time. There's really no need to change. The customers haven't complained. But just because your customers haven't said anything doesn't mean that they're happy with your content. And that shouldn't limit you. And usually when it's a comfort solution, when they're saying, well, I'm comfortable, that usually has to do with fear. Cost is another factor. Like, well, you know, I get word for free. <laughs> but you're not seeing the true cost if you're saying that because it does cost you. It costs you in so many other ways um, that you're not putting a dollar sign on. So you're short sighting yourself um, if you're using that as an excuse. And I will say when you go into XML, there are some costs because you're going into an authoring tool suite um, rather than just using a desktop publishing tool that's not designed to handle content and do the things that you need to do. So the value too is, you know, sometimes 
they're unable to present the value to the C-suite so that they understand. Or maybe there is a value statement inside the company where they don't understand the value of the documentation. If anything ever goes wrong and there's an audit on the documentation, then they start to see the value. If there's never uh, an audit, then sometimes they don't see the value. Um, and that's just a matter of just being able to explain and helping them understand the importance of the content. Because once you start to explain things in, in a way that they understand, then they get it. So some of the benefits of XML, and I know some of these I've talked about before, but some of my favorite benefits are the ability to write at once because, you know, generally I'm pretty lazy. I don't want to have to keep repeating myself over and over again. So if I can do it once and I can change it and update it everywhere, I mean, that's the thing. So we talked about earlier, if you change that H3, then you have to open up all those documents and find the instance because it's hard coded inside the document to make the change. Now, if I'm in XML and I change the way I want titles to look inside of a graphic, like say I have graphics with titles and I want to change the way that font looks for that type of instance only. In XML, all I need to do is change the publishing interpretation of the title so that then I just republish, that's it. And it's done, every single document just push through automatic, automatic, automatic. I don't have to manually open anything as an author. I don't need to change every single document. I can push it through and the machine will do it automatically for me. So my chance of missing things is drastically reduced to virtually zero because the machine is looking for all of the figures and it will find them all. Um, can't always trust your eyes to catch everything. Reuse, now there's so many ways that reuse becomes so critical and such a huge time saving. So many things about reuse I don't really have time to go into um, here, but with XML structured authoring, reuse is a big thing. And in certain architecture types, you even get more exponential improvements in your reuse ability. Automation, I mean, I just talked about one example of the benefits of automating the process, right? Your eyes don't always catch things, but the machine will. And as long as you've, you've given the correct descriptive markup language to the content, then it automatically will handle things. Speed, this allows you to really focus, you know, as writers, I mean, you start to see the picture here that if writers aren't worrying about formatting, which really that's not the value. If you've got professional and technical writing team or people or a person, their value is not in formatting. Their value is not in writing cool, kitschy little code. Their value is in creating content that improves your user's experience and improves your user's view of you as a company. And if they're not worrying about formatting, they can focus on their true value and, and you can reallocate their time into improving those things that really matter for your company. Accuracy, oh my goodness. There are so many things in accuracy that, that changes drastically when you're in structured authoring. I can't even tell you. I think we've talked about localization enough. Um, adaptability, you know, how do you want to produce your output? Who is your customer that you're serving? And what medium do they want it in? This is the ultimate in adaptability because you're no longer locked into what you see is what you get, right? You're in a descriptive markup that can handle anything. How do you want it? Do you want fries with that? Like it, it'll do just about anything you want it to do. So then the question I get from people um, is how and when do you make that transition? Like what makes the most sense? 
hopefully by now you're getting the idea that XML is probably a really good way for you to go if you're in desktop publishing. But how and when to do it? Because one of the things that I've, I've gotten from people on the no side is because, well, we've got all of this content that we've created and it's all in Word. I don't want to have to move that stuff over. That to me is a very weak and kind of short-sighted argument because it's not doing you, your customer, or your company a service, keeping it locked into an old way when you can take it into the next level. And when do you start? Will you start now? I mean, it really, there's no time like the present. But as in anything, preparation, preparation, advanced preparation is key. I think the more you prepare ahead of time, the smoother your transition is in adopting a new technique, technology, and tool, because you're going to be doing all three of those things. You're not going to write the same way. You're going to be able to adapt to new techniques and new technology. Um, but the first thing you need to start with is the people. If you're a manager, you need to prepare your team, right? If you're a peer bringing this up, you need to prepare your peers and your manager, right? If you're a writer of one, you need to prepare your management team and get their buy-in. They need to support it because it will take time and it will take money. Not a huge amount of money. I think that, you know, there's more than one sol solution out there that will do XML authoring and publishing. Um, and they're all priced about the same, but there is a cost associated with those. So you will need to have budget and you need to have that budget support. You're also going to want to get support from other departments. Um, while they're not directly authoring the content, they are important. Because there is no other department in an organization that touches every department like technical writing or professional writing. Every department uses it. So you'll want support from other departments, at least their understanding and their patience while you're making this transition and communicating with them and having a good communication plan up front is really going to help you in the long run. Some resources that you want to make sure you set up for yourself is you want to start with analysis. Analysis, analysis, analysis. And everybody hates this. I think I can't tell you how many people jump to tools first, but no tool is going to solve your problem unless you've got a good analysis of what you want solved. Um, know your publishing calendar. And here's where it's like, well, we've got, you know, all these thousands of records that are, you know, already done in this. Uh, what you see is what you get desktop mode. How do I make the transition? Well, you're going to look at your publishing calendar, you know your content, and you're going to figure out, well, what's high to maybe I go with high touch, high visibility first for a quick win. Or depending on your type of publication, maybe I'm going to go for a mid range that has a longer lead time so I can give myself time to publish. It depends on what you're creating and what you're generating. That really does dictate what you start with. And for those of you who have those thousands of documents locked up in desktop world, once you select an architecture, which is your next step, and you're going to want to pick an architecture that works for you, XML <clears throat> is in a lot of architecture types, right? It's in DocBook, it's in DITA, it's in S1000D, it's in all the mill standards, it's in ATA, it's all XML. But XML allows them to have a little bit of their rule preferences. So they're a little bit different. So you want to know your architecture and you want to create your style guide. And this is just documenting how you want things to look in long form so that when you sit down to create the rules for automation, you've got a good understanding of what you want to happen. The other thing you need to budget for and budget time and money for it is in training. Um, you really want to invest in your people if you want to maximize the benefits of moving over into XML. You really do want to get some training. How much training? Well, 
you know, we believe that you should have just the right amount when you need it. It doesn't mean that you have to sit in a classroom for days on end trying to learn something and remember it. We do things a little different. It's single sourcing solutions and we scaffold the learning, right? So that you're adjusting and adapting and you're able to meet your deliverables for your deadlines that exist right now, as well as integrating and learning new methods and new technologies. So it's a little different approach. Um, things to look out for. Okay, everyone's not gonna be as excited as you. <laughs> That's okay. That's just reality. Just be aware of it. You're not going to convert everybody there. You know, you don't have to be an XML evangelist um, as long as they have an understanding and just know you're going to get some pushback. That's that's just how it happens. You get subject matter experts or product managers that have an opinion and you need to listen to it, um, but you need to show them why you're making the change in the difference. And a lot of times we've had a, one of our recent clients, uh, we were taking their team through topic authoring and the product managers were all a flutter about, you know, you're changing things. So what we did is we did a demonstration of before and after. And when they saw the after, they were completely on board. They totally got what we were saying. They were 100% behind the technical writing team and had full buy-in. Don't take on everything at once. So if you've got tons of documents that are back there in the archives, but you want to bring them up into XML, you know, you can have a data conversion company do that. Once you've picked your architecture, they can map things over. You may need to do some cleanup. You will need to do some cleanup. Um, but you can take that as 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 the approach. Now, sometimes if you're adopting a new um, organizational architecture, like if you're going from something very traditional based and you're wanting to implement something like DITA, oftentimes you might want to reauthor things because they're the the technology has changed so much. And the way things are done have changed so drastically with DITA that to really take advantage of it, it's easier just to reauthor it. That may be a situation. Um, and always pick the architecture that works best for you, not because somebody else is telling you that you need to do it, unless, of course, <laughs> it's a big contract and they're telling you, you will do it this way. <laughs> There's like, you know, in the United States, we have mill standards and there are several mill standards. And based on the contract you're working on, you will do it their way. That's it. And that's OK. That's what your contract is about. Now, sometimes and we have clients who've done this, they have adopted one architecture to start and then adopted another architecture. They start out in DocBook, and then they adopt DITA as an architecture. And sometimes, based on their publication type, they'll run parallel. They'll have both DITA and DocBook based on what the content is and if there's that definite separation. So there's all kinds of configurations. You need to do what works best for your company. All right, so the things that you're going to need, you're going to need tools. You will need tools. Tools are important. I use my handy pliers for all kinds of things. This is probably my favorite tool in the toolbox are my pliers because they'll open jars, <laughs> they'll pull tabs, I can pull nails out of the wall, all kinds of things. Um, so tools are important, but don't overcomplicate things. You really, you only need a tool that will help you author publish, and you're going to want to store your information. Um, and that there's different strategies, like some architecture, like you really, I can't emphasize enough the importance of content repositories and storing your information. Now, some things will let you grow into these solutions, but at minimum, you're going to need to author the information and you're going to need to publish it. So you're going to need something to compose the information, right? You need those two steps. And of course, you're going to have to store it. Either you're going to store it in an archaic file system or you're going to store it in a com uh, content management solution. The one thing I will tell you is you should never, ever have to compromise the quality or a valid requirement for a tool. 
And that's all I'm going to say on that. You should not have to compromise. Um, some things to look out for, though, uh, <laughs> is look out for hidden costs. So, you know, uh, there's some great open source. Open source projects are fun and interesting, but they're not designed to be prime time. Like it's not something you may want to hinge the credibility of your company on an open source project. Um, I don't think it's the safest net to be in. And oftentimes I've found that companies that have these types of things mixed into their ecosystem for their tool chain, they end up with people who are uber geeks who like to geek around. Now, if you want to develop a software development team inside your company, then perhaps this is OK. I don't think it works so well on a scalable way. I think you invite some problems. And there are some hidden costs, even though you might say, well, open source is free. It is not. It is not. It never has been and it never will be. And the costs can hit you down the road. Um, you want to look out for something that's scalable, something that will grow as you, your needs grow, not something where you have to get the whole shebang, maybe something where you can get pieces and add to it as you grow. Something that's adaptable. This is probably a personal preference for me is I don't want to be locked in by a tool. Remember I told you about some of my clients, our clients at Single Sourcing Solutions, who actually literally had to run parallel with DocBook and Dita um, and ran parallel for a while. And some you know, migrated over to Dita, but they had a couple of different architectures. Another one of our clients, they actually do do things for the defense industry as well as their own commercial stuff. So they need tools that are adaptable, that can handle multiple types of architecture without having to change out their tool chain. Clutter is another thing. How many unique vendors do you have? And that uniqueness means how many calls do you need to make if something goes wrong? We all like to think that tools are infallible and that they never break, that software never has bugs. But we all know that's not true. So something will go wrong and you need to make a call. Who are you going to call? If you've got a lot of different vendors in your tool solution suite, then you're going to have to make a lot of phone calls. You've got some third party software trying to get these two to communicate. And then you've got finger pointing and still you've got a problem to solve. So you could end up with a mess on your hands. It's just something to be aware of when you're making your decisions. I like to look at support because how a company um, supports you and supports their community is how they're going to be with you, right? It's kind of like, you know, when you get to meet people and you see how they are with their friends and family, well, that's how they're going to treat you. So I like to look at the vendor and I like to look at the community they build, um, how engaged and involved are they? Are there third parties? How are they in supporting um, the solutions? Another thing you want to look out for is IT support. What kind of infrastructure do you need to have internally or externally? Is it a hosted solution or is it an internal solution? Is it uh, yeah. So what does it take to keep it running smooth, basically, from an IT infrastructure perspective? That's important. And you want to be aware of it so you have those costs factored in. Another odd thing that I always like to look at is how do you get out? It's kind of like that prenup. Because when you're committing to a solution, it's all great. And you think, oh, I'm going to be here forever. But you don't own the tools that you buy somebody else does. And say they go one way, you go another. They zig, you zag. Well, maybe there might come a time where you need to part ways. You need to be aware of what does it take to do that down the road. Because that can make a huge difference for you, right? So be aware of what the exit is when you're getting involved. It's just a safety precaution. So 
Um, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but we are not a part of PTC's channel program. We were in the past, but we are not right now. But I do want to talk to you about ArborText. And this is like, this is just my favorite thing. So this is the, these are the pieces that go into the ArborText uh, solution suite for authoring and publishing. And these pieces will give you absolutely everything you could ever possibly want or need to go all the way from zero into augmented reality into space and beyond. Um, you don't have to have all of these pieces all at once. You can just get what you need. I know of one person writing teams, right? Because again, we work with some of our clients are one person writing team. Uh, some of her, you know, five, like there's writing teams that are a, a number in the thousands. So I know that these things scale to the small, to the medium and to the large. So for me, again, that was one of my priorities too, is the scalability. Now, I want something that's easy to use. And that's why I put this at the top. And honestly, if you're taught the right way, it is so easy to use the ArborText tools it's not even funny. You can create style sheets without being a programmer. You don't have to code anything. You have to understand how to navigate the tool, but it's easy to learn. We've written books on the subjects. So it really is easy. It's difficult if you wanna make it difficult. There's online help. You can self-guide yourself if you want, but Personally, I think it's much better if you take somebody with you to help mentor you along the way and give you just the right amount of support because it alleviates a lot of frustration. You've got a lot to handle when you're learning a new technology. Um, the ArborText tools can handle anything you can throw at it. Any advanced magazine, high quality text wrapping, all kinds of tricks with letters, you know, sentences that go left to right or right to left or up to down. ArborText can handle it. So any of those demands, I mean, if you need that high magazine quality, then you're looking at layout developer and editor. If you have the typical, most of our customers are on editor and styler and they have publishing engine, depending on the size of their team. Windchill is the content management solution. And that one is, I think really critical, especially if you're going to do dittos and architecture, you really need to have content management. Windchill works wonderfully. There's a check in, check out. There's that whole process of being able to audit all of your content. What was changed, why it was changed, when it was changed, and who approved it. Like it's beautiful. Um, if you have illustrations that you're creating, then, you know, Creo, if you're going to do 3D and go into augmented reality and isodrop, all you're doing is isometrics. Or maybe you've got an engineering team that gives you the illustrations just the way you want with all the callouts in place. If you don't, then you've got some illustration tools. The nice thing about all of these tools is they work nicely together out of the box. Um, one call. Right. If something goes wrong, one call fixes it all. The other good thing, you know, software changes and evolves, you know, they do some changes, some bug fixes, some feature adaptions. So they're going to have new revisions that come out. But before it gets to you, if you've got the solution suite, then they're vetting it one piece against the next. So those wheels that fall off the bus when you've got so many vendors coming at it or you've got, you know, the open wallet thing when you're doing the open source thing and you have to go and write all this code, you don't, you remove all of that hassle and all of that worry. So no more sleepless nights about will it work? There, these work out of the box. Like you can plug it in, <laughs> turn it on and get started. It works out of the box. And in fact, when we teach people how to do style and build their style sheets, um, we use the out of the box style and build from that. And it creates a certain level of safety. Again, think of version control when the software gets updated, or if you've forgotten something, it's a great backfill. So there's a whole methodology that saves you a lot of hassle. It is standards based. So you create XML files and editor, any XML aware tool can interpret it. 
plain and simple. I think, personally, I think there's a lower, a much lower cost of ownership. I think the tools out there, like if you were to create apples to apples and do a comparison, I think they're all priced pretty much about the same. Um, but when I'm looking at long-term ownership of it and uh, it's uptime versus downtime and uh, the the uh, response time and all of these factors, then I think there's a lower cost of ownership. So that's my two cents about Arbor Text. Okay, really quick though, before everybody leaves, I want to encourage you to go check out Room 42 or TC Dojo. Those are those uh, public works projects that we talked about earlier. And if you want to hear, learn more about us, you can see what others have to say um, on our website. And there is my email. So if you found the Easter eggs, please do send me an email. And there's Liz's email. So reach out.